Out of the world, I know exactly what are three things that I want to teach my kids. I wasn't born with that knowledge. To acquire it, I had to follow somewhat a fairy tale plot. Um, cross seven seas, like literally hand steering under sail, and climb way more than seven mountains. And that search have started uh, quite a while ago, when I had the privilege to experience a very early and a very painful midlife crisis. I was 28. I don't know why I've earned that privilege. Maybe because I started to work like serious office jobs already at 16, so mathematically it somehow made sense. But whatever caused my midlife crisis, when it did hit, I behaved in a usual way. I have left job, a pretty good and sound career in corporate. I have divorced. And uh, I went up the mountain. Living job was very liberating. It felt like heaven. Living family was hell. And mountains, mountains just happened. It was an accident. Once in February, in Iceland, in Reykjavik, I found myself stuck in a hotel with a closed gym. So to get some movement, I decided to go up the local hill instead. And my gear was like, I was totally not ready. My gear was grossly inappropriate. Thanks to rubber boots at certain angles, I was like sliding backwards, thrice the speed that I was climbing up. And it was already very late in the evening when I finally got myself out of this self-made disaster of a hike and into the warm shower. And my legs ached terribly. But my head was clear and my spirits were joyful. And in fact, I just loved what happened. I like loved, loved, loved what happened. It brought me so much joy that it would be simply silly not to repeat. Hmm. And just like that, mountains have entered my life. Alps, Ants, Himalayas, Alaska, glaciers, volcanoes, and mountains have brought some change. I was a general manager at the time, and soon it appeared that um, shareholders that would be thrilled by my never-ending mountain expeditions, do not exist. So I had to start my own business instead. Also, not all of my friends have felt the lure of long mountain expeditions or were dreaming to spend a typical day on altitude. A typical day that would start somewhere um, in the middle of the night, in a tent, you open your eyes in a sleeping bag, and you look on your pants, and your pants are looking at you, <laughs> shimmering with frost, and you know that they are so frozen, you can knock on them. And yet you have to get out of this sleeping bag and put them on to be ready for the day, the day that would involve hauling uh, 40 kilograms on your back, and sometimes maybe 20 more on a sledge, and break trail in a knee-deep snow for six to 12 hours straight. But in the evening, you have a prospect of a shower. That involves one liter of ice-cold water and squatting for some privacy between pile of snow and the tent. And luckily, my second husband has seen all that the way I have seen all that. So soon, mountaineering became uh, a family hobby. Life is uh, ironic. Um, mountains have led me out of the life, uh, midlife crisis because it appeared that in order for me to think and to progress with my, with my thinking, I have to move, preferably uphill, preferably surrounded by snow. So my brain is literally powered by my legs. And these long expeditions were the best like, method for me to, to think. That method had a downside, though. Mountaineering is not a very swift and cost-effective 
way to mature. And I wish I would be able to uh, have the same results on a meditation mat. My bank account would be like utterly thankful. Very long time, up until recent, all my affairs with the outdoors stayed absolutely private. I felt no need to explain uh, where I'm going, why I'm going there, and also uh, to share revelations upon return. But then my life uh, had a twist. And that twist have brought me on the stage today. I had uh, twins. <sighs> no seas, no mountains can compare. And bringing up twins is a subject of a different TED talk altogether, but I can say for now, I have no idea how mother of triplets survive. <laughs> I bow to them. So my kids would be one and a half years old in this December. And of course, I have like a long wish list for them. I want them to be analytical, I want them to be independent and have, be full of empathy, have loads of skills and tons of knowledge, and I have no idea how I will get there from my current level of parental objectives, like availability of clean clothes, and sometimes like, sweetie, please let me wash your face. But um, more than them being clean, I want them to be happy and feel accomplished, and feel um, at peace with themselves. And exactly that have crystallized what are the most important thoughts that I have brought with myself from the mountains. And I'd love to pack those realizations very neatly into like lunch boxes and give it to my kids. Lunch boxes, I wish someone would have given to me when I was little. And the first one would say, trust in your dreams at all times, especially cherish your childhood ones, especially if they seem silly, because there is purity in childhood dreams that is gold. And those dreams, they're not coming from nowhere. They are born here at your core. So dig deep, find what it is, get it in your hands and trust it. Think about the dream as you would think about a, a chocolate box. Dream itself is just, it's just a wrapper. What is valuable, it's what's inside, what makes that dream to appear. Like you figure out what it is and you have one sweet life. When I was little, I was dreaming about diving the Mariana Trench. Obviously, as I grew up, I have confused directions and climbed Mount Everest instead. But for me, that was the same dream. That was about a journey, about um, hugging the world, about exploration. And the fact that I have trusted my childhood impulse and fulfilled it in many different ways have made me a very, very happy person. And uh, I'll challenge you now. Like right here, in just a few seconds, please, think about one dream. Go. Have you thought of one? What is it? And now think what have made you dream that dream. Because there, right there, is the key to your happy life. And my second lunchbox would say, achievements are tricky. Achievements and happiness are not the same. Achievements for the sake of achievements can be deadly. Of course, not everyone who makes it to the top of the mountain makes it back. And the fine line between making it up and making it back may be not defined by equipment or experience or training. It may be defined by a perspective, an attitude we're taking 
towards achieving objectives. High up in Himalayas, I was sharing a, a cup of tea and a warm conversation with people who have made it to the top, but who have not made it back to base camp. Good, gracious people who have not returned. And I do respect their decisions, and I do respect their choices, and I will mourn them in my heart. But I want people to make it back. And I want my kids to always make it back. So I thought maybe it would be easier for them if they would know that there are two types of achievements, the outer achievements and the inner achievements. And the outer achievements is something which is typically seen by everyone, like summit in a mountain, run, running a profitable business or winning a prize. And those achievements are great, they are amazing, but not in themselves, but mere as a, as a side effect to one's passion. And there's also the inner achievements, something that only you know that is valuable, like turning your back on a summit, or keeping your integrity, even if you lose profits, or not to competing, even if you can win. Outer achievements and inner achievements. Celebrate the latter. And um, my third lunchbox would say, and darlings, please, don't take yourself so very seriously. And I felt that concept right about here. That is a ridge of Mount Everest. You see, in mountains, your persona is just dwarfed by the majestic of beauty of the peaks. And a person is nothing compared to a mountain. But as you climb high, right about here, uh, you see that you are standing on a limestone that is full with marine life, like marine fossils. You are eight kilometers high, and you're standing on marine life. How can it be? Everest, apparently, is a very young mountain. It's 40 to 60 million years young. So before Indian and Asian plates collided and gave birth to Himalayas, there was a shallow ocean. So if person is nothing compared to the mountain, mountain is nothing compared to life on our planet. And as you climb during the night, it's very, very easy to zoom out even further, because there's black sky all around, and it's purposely black. And there are stars not only on top, but also sideways, and also below you. So you literally feel that you're swimming in stars while standing with your feet on a little blue speck called Earth, a part of a tiny planetary system in a small galaxy somewhere in the outskirts of the universe. And if that is the perspective to take, then why are we taking ourselves so very seriously? Why in the spaces of our offices and our cars, it seems that the world is revolving around our objectives and our failures? Because it clearly does not. If we fail, the only one thing that will suffer, maybe, would be our ego. The universe is going to be just fine. So that self-importance, it uh, just enhances the fear of failure. It's just making you stiff. Feeling important is like, imagine a, a tall pedestal, and you're putting yourself on a very tall pedestal. So you're standing there, and now you try to jump for joy. That's pretty difficult, right? It's way easier to jump for joy when you stand with your feet on the ground. And I do want my kids to jump for joy. I do want them to stand with their feet on the ground and yet have their heads in the sky and reach for the impossible and not be afraid. And this is exactly why I want them not to take themselves so very seriously. So three small things. Trust in your dreams. Listen to your dreams. They're coming from your core. Celebrate the inner achievements. And don't take yourself so very seriously. But there is no guarantee that my kids will open my lunchboxes 
or listen to what I say, or respect my opinion, or like what I like, or have, have the same goods and bads, you know, just to make the whole parenting thing more fun. So, what shall I do? What can I do to help them to be happy and feel accomplished and at peace with themselves? And I'm afraid I'm left only with the one tool, and that is uh, to walk the talk. So I'm scrambling all my courage to continue dream impossible dreams, like circumnavigating the world with my family one day. And I'm scrambling all my grit to put one foot in front of the other, even if at times those feet are trembling, and oh boy, do they tremble as I see my one-year-olds roaming on a sailboat. And as I'm standing here on the stage today and pouring my heart out and trying not to take myself so very seriously and hoping that with my life I can manifest what I preach. And if I fail, maybe 20 years from now, my kids will listen to this talk and understand that I have tried.